George. I'm with uh, Dr. George Sparks. He's our archaeologist, and we've got something fun planned for today. We're going to talk about the period of the judges, right, George? Uh, that's right, period of the judges, and uh, it's going to be interesting. We tried this once before, and uh, <laughs> so here we are, the second attempt, but uh, pra practice makes perfect, so maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, so you, you uh, selected um, the Song of Deborah, because that's so early and it's in the period of Judges. Correct. You know, uh, Jud uh, the Song of Deborah, uh, I'd say in most cases among scholars is some of the earliest literature that they agree with in the Hebrew text, in our what we would call the Old Testament, if you will. Okay. And then there's another really early one, and that's the Song of Miriam. Miriam, that's correct. So those are the two right there that you just mentioned that the majority of scholars agree with as being some of the earliest texts uh, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, mentions as a type of poetry. And what can we gain from that? That's what we're going to look at. Okay. Okay. Well, both of them are the Song of the Women, which is really kind of interesting. That what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint. because. Okay. What I've attempted to do is to give a, a timeline so people can figure out what we're doing. Now, I t tend to date Abraham to 2000. Is that legitimate? Mm. There's, of course, there's going to be variants, right? Uh, we put 2000 BC in what we call it, possibly the inter intermediate period uh, or an early stage of Middle Bronze Age. Okay. So but, this I, mean, is, I don't want, want to get complicated because I look at archaeology and other people will say, well, th what does that mean? I would say scholars do put Abraham in the Middle Bronze Age. Let's leave it like that. And we'll date Middle Bronze Age with an intermediate period between 2100 all the way to 1550 BC. Then it, okay. It's all conclusive. Okay. So let's don't fight. <laughs> okay. So we'll just call it 2000 BC and know that it... It, there's it, a menos, we say in New Mexico. There you go. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So then comes the period of the bond in, bondage in Egypt. Then God takes them out of Egypt, and that's when we get the period of the judges. And that's what we're going to be talking about is the period of the judges. Now, I just have some other things just um, um, uh, to show. Let's see if I can. Yeah, there we go. Um, so following the period of the judges is a very tiny, brief little United Kingdom of David and Solomon. Because after that, it splits into the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And then, of course, comes the conquest first by the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. So we're going back to a very, very early time in Israel's history, right? Yeah, it's really... So that's what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to be in the period of the judges. Okay, and then what I wanted to show was in the period of the judges, they're still in the in the tribal um areas now this is what's been allocated to them but they haven't occupied it all <laughs> because it's in those days there was no king in israel every man did what was right in his own eyes right you know right there's a, a very inter interesting statement in itself okay uh once again i don't want to get too complicated in this but no king in israel well remember at the earliest stages they're not supposed to have a king at all so when we're in the time of the judges, it can't be a thought in their mind that they're going to have a king, not until later on. So when somebody is actually writing this, there appears to be a king at that time, and they're telling the people during the time period where Israel has a king, back then, we didn't have a king. Does that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense. So it seems to me, from what I've read, is that the, the book of Judges was probably composed during the time of David, maybe Solomon, but probably David, relating events that occurred earlier. There you right? go. That's that's a nice way of saying it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's see what else I got here. So um, this is it's called the Song of Deborah, but she's not the one singing it. Actually, it's the it's the ladies. Um, and I just wanted to point out here. You see how Ephraim is the is the tribe up in the hill country. Yeah. And then the two tribes, Zebulun and Naph Naphtali, they're also up in the hills of Galilee. So, and, and the trade route is coming down through the Jezreel Valley. 
and passes through the uh, pass at Megiddo. So the, the Jews during the time of the judges, they're not where the, where the Canaanites live. They're hugging up into the hills where it's safe, right? That's the way it appears. And uh, we could actually look at other texts outside the Bible as trying to make a determination of where Israel is posted. And it still appears that they're up in that hill country. They're away from the trade route. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I think I have, let's see, something here. Um, okay. So this is really kind of interesting because um, Deborah's the one uh, telling, you know, Barak's the leader, you know, and he went and he got the people from the two, the two northern tribes up there. Um, and and she's giving him directions. And she says, you know, with your men, you're to get up on the top of Mount Tabor. And I have a picture of Mount Tabor. And it's really kind of funny, because if they're up on Mount Tabor, which is in the middle of the Jezreel Valley, they're stuck. There's no way they can escape, right? That's, you know what, it's it's a, a high altitude location, which means if somebody attacks, they're going to have to attack uphill, which actually, in a way, that's good strategy, right? Because you're trying to go uphill with what, your chariots and everything? That's that, that's really not great, great strategy on the half of, you could say, uh, the king of Hotsor. Um, but they are up there. So what would you do if you say bad strategy? What you do is you circle it and starve them to death. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So the only way they're going to enter a battle is to come down off of Mount Tabor. <laughs> and, and that's the strategy that... Uh, their adversaries want, because remember in the text it says their adversaries have chariots, and chariots they use the term also iron, iron, you know, not that they're iron chariots, but there's parts of the chariots that have iron, so they're just chariots of iron. Uh, so it's not great strategy for the, if I could say, the Israelites to come down off the hill and fight in the valley, where the chariots can be used, uh, but. I'm not going to try to ruin it ahead of its time, but if you're at a high altitude, you can actually see something from a distance. Maybe, and I'll just say maybe, what Deborah saw, all right, was thunderclouds. If they fight in the valley with chariots, which are heavy, all right, and they have a, a, a light infantry, the Israelites, what's going to happen to those chariots during a thunderstorm? And that's what happens. I mark the Kishon River because that's actually where the battle takes place is the right. Kishon River. So um, they're going to get stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, you know, the the Canaan, they're Canaanites from um, from Hatsor and they had 900. It says 900 chariots of iron, but the whole thing won't be iron. Right. Yeah, that's correct. You can't, it'd be a misnomer if you had a uh, it'd be like having an automobile drawn by, uh, you know, by horses. <laughs> yeah. Like so actually, the statement would actually be, you know, like that. But what fascinates me is that the wheels had um, iron spikes that went out. Well, so that if you got too close, you got cut, right? Uh, I would, you know, we talked about that before, you know, that that would be more like the Roman period for something like that. Oh, okay. But what's interesting is in archaeological excavations, they found, um, you could say, pins made of iron to fasten parts of the chariot to the wood because iron would not bend as easily as bronze. So in that case, they have evidence of the terminology iron used for chariots. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And iron was not um, um, in, in large use at the time oh, of the judges, right? That's an excellent statement right there. That's an excellent point. Um, in King Tut's tomb in the Valley of the Kings, all right, uh, they found a sword made of, not really a sword, it was a knife made of iron. And of course, uh, iron was so rare that it was cherished even more than gold and silver. So the first example that I know of in archaeology of something made of iron, because iron will rust if it's in the ground, but it was preserved in the tomb, was the iron dagger, I shouldn't have said sword, a dagger uh, of King Tut. And it was along with his gold dagger. All right. Now, what does this mean? 
actually in archaeology, we start the Iron Age at 1200 BC. And King Tut's tomb would be more like um, 1320. So that puts us 100 years earlier than what we would start our Iron Age. Make sense? Okay. That's a rarity because it is in the king's tomb. So when would we see Iron Age, iron among the populace of the people? They was, well, the earliest would be 1200 BC. All right. And so we'd have to place this event somewhere where they're using iron. And it'd have to be after 1200 BC. So I'd say maybe later on in the 12th century, so 1160, because we have the Philistines involved. So 12th century, 11th century, and we have evidence for small iron use among the Philistines in their chariots during that period, okay? And and I date um, David to 1000 BC. That's so this true. would be, you know, not too long before the United Kingdom formed by David. Yeah, it could possibly be maybe a hundred years or so, because yeah. even when we read about the time of David and he's going to fight Goliath, remember that? And he goes to uh, Saul and it says that there's only two swords found among the Israelites, among Saul and Jonathan. So what does that say about the weaponry of Israel at that time? And first well, Samuel also mentions that they have to go to the Philistines. No blacksmiths are found among Israel and they have to go to the Philistines to get their plowshares sharpened for the cost of a pim. All right, a pim is a little stone weight and it'll have an inscription on it that designates a pim. And it's about the size maybe of your, your finger like that. And that's about it. So they're very hard to find an archeological dig. And so they're rare, but they have evidence of this. So what is well, that? We, go ahead, I'm sorry. This is a perfect time now because you, you um, made this uh, image of, <laughs> of the weapon. <laughs> And so the top one is is Hittite, the bottom is Egyptian, and then there's the Israelite in the middle. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, it's not a lot there, right? <laughs> yeah. If I was so, an Israelite and that was mine, I kind of feel like, oh, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so so here they were coming against the chariots with, with their little dinky little. And what would the blade be made of in the period of the judges? This is absolutely bronze. Bronze. Okay. Yeah. So Certainly remember, not iron. It appears that. Some scholars would suggest that Israel does not have iron until the time period of David. Right. Some have actually, I say some scholars, that means they don't all agree. Believe that what David did, remember when he was among his uh, band of uh, merry men, <laughs> yeah. he was actually uh, in Ziklag, which was a Philistine city. Could it be that he gained the Philistine technology of making iron during the time period when he was at uh, Renegade and he was also hiding out among the Philistines? Some mm -hmm. say, some say this could be the case uh, where the Israelites started to gain the technology of making iron. But like I have to say, there's speculation on that. But it's during yeah. the time period of David the king where they seem to start to get the upper hand against the Philistines. That would come after the period of the of the judges. Oh, yes. this is a wonderful picture. This is um th this is the river, <laughs> Kishon River. Right. And it's a modern event, you know. With Aga uh, is the state of Israel. There, <laughs> there are buses, and there was apparently a flash flood up up in the hill country. The water came down, and and the bus got stuck. <laughs> Perfect. And example that's what, what happened, 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 right? The, yes. Uh huh. There you go. And that's what happened in the battle? That's what, yeah, that's what the Bible states. That makes sense. The advantage that the Israelites had, you could say, well, uh, faith in God, but also if we're going to look at strategy, military strategy, going down into the valley is not a smart move until there's a, let's say, flash flood, a rainstorm. Now the chariots are of no use. Matter of fact, they're a hindrance. They get stuck. And now they're like fair game. You know, it's better to be a foot soldier soldier than on a chariot that's stuck with your horses. And that's kind of a bad predicament to be in. Yeah. And this is um, it, it's given in that in that poetry. That's that very ancient 
text, the stars fought from heaven from their courses, they fought against Sisera, the torrent of Kishon swept them away, the ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. Uh -huh. And, <laughs> and that, that's a really ancient text, that, that poetry. It's ancient poetry, but it does give us a lot of information yeah. about the time period and the groups that are involved, uh, such as you could say, uh, the soldiers of Cicero, you know, from Hatsor. And then, of course, in the poetry, it also mentions certain tribes that weren't there. You know, where's Dan? Yeah. You know, and so that's a good question. Where are they? And what's going on? And it's just like you think there's a great unification during the time period of the judges that according to the, the early poetry, it's not. Right? Yeah. So let me see what I've got here. Oh, so it's the women who follow the men into battle. So they're not in battle, but they're sort of on the outskirts of the battle. Right. And they're there right. to, you know, they, they've got food, they've got water. And, and when the battle is over, they go, they go in and they, um, if, if their husbands or members of the family are hurt, they, they help them. But if uh, otherwise, they're just, um, they're stealing all, uh, everything, right? From the, from the enemy on the okay. field of battle. And that's, that's a good point. You know, uh, we mentioned before, uh, and I think it's widely known, a stela, either called the Merneptah stela, which was the son of Ramsey, or it's also called the Israelite stela. It dates to around 1208 BC. Remember, it's 19th dynasty, Ramsey's passed away, now it's his son, Merneptah, so it's called the Merneptah stela, but is the first mention of Israel outside the Bible. And this is, is the period by, of the judges, yeah. Well, it's it's possibly during the time period of Joshua, let's say, which is going to lead right into the period of the judges. This is very close, very close, okay. all right? This is interesting now because we can piece a lot together through poetry because the Egyptian Merneptah stealer or the Israelite stealer is Egyptian poetry, all right? Okay. Now... Yeah. You just mentioned women in battle. A lot of people don't know that. Did the women go to battle? How they find? Why would they be there? But so when we, as I'll just say, Christians look at them, burned up to steal. All we read is the part where it mentions Israel and say, "Look, they're there, right?" But there's a lot more. And this is just for you, Anne. At the beginning, it talks about in the burned up to steal. What brings about the carving of the steel? It's the victories of the Egyptians. That they're fighting, number one, the Libyans. All right. So there's a Libyan, a Libyan evasion in northern Egypt. And what the Lib Libyans are doing, they're going after a grocery run <laughs> because it's harvest time. So they're going to confiscate, run over, to get the food, and go back home. Well, guess what? The Egyptians didn't let them do that to their surprise. So this is what happens. It says, off the Meneptestila, it says, the vile chief. The Libyan foe fled in the deep of the night alone. It means he, he fled alone. That's the, he got scared, all right? No plume on his head. That means he lost his crown. And his feet were unshod. He lost his crown. He's fleeing so fast, he lost his shoes. <laughs> this is in the Menef to steal it. Okay, now this is for, for you, Ann. His wives were carried off from his presence. What is his wife's doing there? He's attacking, and yet his wives are there. Because the women, uh, at least this case, according to the Nepta Stila, the women also went with the men into battle. I'm not going to say they did the fighting, but they were there. So when the Libyan king left, he left without his crown. He left without his shoes, meaning he was running really fast to get away. And he also lost his wives. They were, they were captured. Yeah. So, there so the woman that actually agrees with what you're saying in a Egyptian text. So the women were there as, as like support troops. You know, they oh, had they the food, there they had the water. Support, sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when the battle was over, they would go in and strip the enemy. They could do that, or uh, they could get confiscated if they lost, <laughs> you know. Uh, that's, that's true. So what I put up here is the is Miriam, and, and that's the other... Um, uh, a really ancient text of the women 
Mm -hmm. You know, the victory song of the women after the battle, which is what we're going to see in, in the time of the judges. Right. There you go. So let's see what I got here. Um, but remember also, there we go. When, when Sisera didn't come back in time, right? Yeah. They were saying, well, that's because he's out there confiscating the goods and the, the garments and the women. Remember, every two women for every guy, something like that. And, and yeah. it happened to be the case. Right. But that's another indication of those times, which we have in the Menupta Stila, a validation of what exactly could happen. Yeah. And I put this up because this is, um, this is that poetry right. um, that, that's supposed to be so ancient. You know, awake, awake, Deborah. Now, Deborah was the one that was, you know, leading them into battle. Awake, awake, sing a song, arise, Barak. Barak was the one that Deborah had selected to be the general of, of the Israelites. Arise, Barak, and take away your captives. So this is the song. And then comes something really interesting. It says, the leaders led in Israel, the people volunteered, bless the Lord. Well, um, the... The Hebrew for volunteered is a free will offering. Okay. So the, the the those now there were only three tribes that went into battle, right? Right. There wasn't um, one. If you're right. Manasseh, Zebulun, and Naphtali. Those are the three tribes that did the battle, and um, the leaders um, led, and all the rest of the troops gave themselves as free will offerings, which I, I find really exciting, you know, that we're asked to give ourselves as a free will offering to God as, you know, we give ourselves to God as, as servants to God. And, and that's what was happening here in this. Um, and now, oh, here, this comes the fun part, George. Dissera fled away on foot to the tent of Yael, the wife of Hever the Kenna. Ya, yeah. Yael was a Bedouin. And so she lived in a Bedouin tent. And this is a picture of the Bedouins. And Sisera is um, not a Hebrew name. It, so he was apparently a mercenary. And he fled on foot, which really is kind of funny, right? Because he well, was in the chariot. Libyan king. The Libyan king lost his crown, lost his shoes, and took off. We've got some similarities here, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he, he was the general in the, in, the, in the chariot. And now he's fleeing on foot. And he goes to a woman, <laughs> and here she is, out, you know, out in the desert, Yael, uh, to his tent. Um, and I love this picture. My husband and I were in Israel, and um, we visited a, um, uh, a kibbutz that was demonstrating the life of the of the Bedouins. And there were mm -hmm. Bedouins there, uh, you know, showing their life. And my husband took this picture. I think it's just wonderful. It makes me think of of Yael. Yael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, now, turn aside, my master, turn aside. That's, that was the language for that the, a prostitute used, right? Turn aside to me. I'm a prostitute. Come in to me, right? Wow. That, that's a pretty heavy statement, but uh, because it is a, she was somebody's wife, you know. But, you know, uh, However, you're going to capture that man because we know the end result. At least we'll we'll give it away by the end of this lecture here. Well, so I'd say me, pretty I, much so. That's what she's doing. She's seducing this man to feel like it's okay to come into my tent, even though he's running, you know, from uh, the the events of the battle. So it, it's filled with irony um, because the Bedouin tents were divided so that the larger part was for the men and the smaller part was for the women, and so. She's inviting him into the women's part of the tent, mm -hmm. which makes it really kind of funny. And another thing is that Deborah and Yael, their husbands are named, but they never come into the story. So I think what's happening in the time of David, when this thing was um, composed, um, David's trying to talk the leaders of the 12 tribes into coming under his leadership as a united kingdom. And so he's, he's, um, He's playing fun with the men and he's showing it's the women that are doing this thing. It's the women that lead the battle. It's the women that, that kill Cicero, right? Okay. That's, that seems like good political strategy, right? Yeah, it's irony and I, it makes me laugh. And so, yeah, El was the sed seductress. Turn aside, come into my women's side of the tent. I'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. And here's the milk bowl. <laughs> All right. Well, guess what? 
There's the milk bowl. There's there's where the picture came from. It came from the milk bowl that's in your your collection. Cicero said to her, just just give me a little water to drink. I'm thirsty. I need some water. But she didn't give him water. She opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink. And, you know, when my kids were young and they couldn't go to sleep, mm. my husband would warm up a little milk and give them a warm milk to help them go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, El now is acting like the mother, you know, I'm going to give you some warm milk so you can go to sleep. And then she becomes the warrior. That's the most fun, right? Uh, depends on what side you're on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see the picture of the tent peg and the, and the mallet? Right. She, she reached out her hand for the tent peg and her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Cicero. She smashed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. <laughs> and those are the tools of the women. It's, it's, it is an, a very interesting text. Now, even though I agree with you, that was probably, we could say, edited at a much later time. Yeah. But they also had earlier information because, you know, like the Canites were actually cousins to uh, the Midianites because Moses married a Midianite, remember? Sephora. Right. Or Sephora. And uh, so the fact that Sisera goes to a Kenite, well, the Kenites were also known for to being, uh, I should say, artificers of metal, making bronze tools. So, you know, in business, I'm sure business-wise, the Canaanites don't care who they sell to. That's business. But when it comes to a battle, that's completely different. Blood is thicker than water. And they are, you could say, relatives to the Israelites. Where's the loyalty now? The loyalty is going to be to the Israelites. Really, that's their clan. Make sense? Yeah. So when she strikes him, uh, well, that's it's pretty clever. It's very clever, and it's and also within the poetry, and that's why we say it's very ancient, because it's giving us clues to the very very early heritage, the very early yeah. elements of Israel, even before you know they start the conquest. Uh, so, um, I, to me, I, as an archaeologist, I find it very fascinating to look at the scriptures and look at the archaeology and also uh, make these validations uh, through a third party, such as the Egyptians. Yeah. Um, so, the, it was the job of the women to put up the tent. Mm -hmm. So, the tent pegs and the mallet were, were women's tools. So, so, she killed this powerful General Sisera with women's right tools and then we get now uh, this part i love between her feet he bowed he fell he laid between her feet he bowed he fell where he bowed there he fell dead <laughs> and that's very interesting too because i'm just going to bring another archaeological reference and it's the armana letters in these armana texts they were found in armana egypt during the middle of the 19th century in the middle of 19th century i mean like 1840s 1850s by a bedouin woman by a bedouin woman now we'll leave it like that there's like 480 of these uh what we call armana texts and they're written in cuneiform that's an early type of mesopotamian uh, writing and they use wedge shapes all right um and in this uh text of uh, the armana letters the translations there's two basic types those that came from the Mesopotamian kings, and because they were more a larger kingdom, they are referred to in a, dip, a diplomatic sense as brothers. These are my brothers, my brother the Pharaoh. Okay, now when we get to the land of Canaan, those little city states, they are serfs. All right, now the serfs, when they write the king. And this is probably uh, Akhenaten or Amenhotep the fourth. They start off, not my brother. They say, oh, I bow down to you. Seven times I faced the earth and I bow down to you. Look at this text right here. It's very humbling. It's a, it's a text of servitude. Between her feet, he bows. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's not, he's not talking. They're not talking about a king now. They're talking about a female. 
yeah. uh, King, uh, general is bowing down between her feet. Now, in that ancient type of text, you're looking at this as I would look at the Mernepta stilas, excuse me, uh, the uh, Amana letters that a serf, a serf in Canaan writing to an Egyptian uh, king diplomatically would turn around and say, I bow down to you seven times. So in this sex, uh, text, you have a, in poetry, I would see a general bowing down to a female. Yeah, I've never just, seen that before. That's part of the I irony. Just say, like, wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's great. That's pretty heavy. And yeah, that is heavy. And then below that, here's what you were talking about. The, the mother of Sisera was expecting him to come back as a victor. Out of the window, go. she looked and lamented the mother of Sisera through the lattice. Why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots tarry? She was expecting him to come back with, you know, women and booty, you know, stuff. And right. he didn't. <laughs> and he didn't. So no. um, very much the, it, it fits the the very ancient agenda that we read of the culture uh, during that time period. Even though we might have some later editorial, like you say, is written during the time period of the kings when they had a court and when they had scribes makes sense. Okay. But the fact that we have some very ancient information in there, scholars would still say it's a the earliest text. And to me, it makes it very, very fascinating, right? Uh also it mentions uh Deborah as the mother of Israel. That's an interesting text too. And it says it in a way, you can say, what does she mean mother of all Israel? Not in a literal sense, but the same way we would say George Washington is the father of our country. Yeah, you know? okay. And we say, well, oh, and we accept that for what it is. You know, so, matter of fact, if I said in a history class, who's the father of our country? They would probably say George Washington. You know? So yeah. in ancient Israel, they would say, well, who's the mother of Israel? They'd probably say, well, Deborah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So putting it in that in that frame, uh, it's to me is extremely fascinating, and uh, a time when Israel had no kings, no male leader chosen. All right. And it also says a statement when they were doing what was right in their own eyes. It means like everybody's doing their own thing. Yeah, it's kind of confusing yeah. in the land. Uh, it's the time of the. Let's just say it's the time of the conquest. People are being overthrown. Um, sometimes Israel lost the fight too, didn't they? And we have judges that step up, and it uses a lot of terminology. We say 40 years. It seems like 40 years something. So 40 to me is a symbolic term, uh, right. unknown time period. You know, 40 is not necessarily a generation, is it? We say, 40, you know, the average life expectancy back then was 20, 20 some years. Yeah. So if you say a generation is 40, that really doesn't make sense. But symbolically, 40 days and 40 nights, you know, 40 years in the wilderness. It makes more sense to say, how long were you in the wilderness? 40 years. What does that mean? Eh, we we're there a long time. Yeah, <laughs> true. Uh, and it was and 40 represents uh trial. Yeah. Uh, they're on they're on trial. Yeah. True, true. Oh, what's also very, very interesting is it mentions other indications, like it mentions Dan. Where was Dan? Dan was among the ships, you know. Well, it could be that Dan isn't up in that northern territory where they finally settle. They're more centrally located among the Philistines, and Philistine means sea people. And we have that little story of uh, Samson going to the Philistines, going out to the coast to meet the, you know, it's the, the bright city lights. And Israel is kind of concerned with that because we don't want to lose our young people to that that new technology, that new uh, group of people that are along the sea coast, right? And uh, he even likes the women, not surprisingly. <laughs> which, uh, which reminds me, we're going to have another interview, and our next interview is going to be about the life of the women in Israel, right? That's correct, and that's going to be so, just as exciting. It, it yeah, really we're, we're going to have fun with that one. Well, thanks, George, and we'll, I'll see you again in our next interview where we're going to talk about the life of women in ancient Israel. Okay, so I got the jewelry ready because women, I know, like jewelry, and we got <laughs> perfume vials here, you know, so it's going to be very, very colorful, and uh, so you don't want to miss it.
because we okay. got lots of artifacts from that time period and jewelry and uh, of course little now these are little scarabs i don't know if you can see one there but these are worn on the ring you know like we talk about signet rings so we got a lot of fun stuff ahead of us yeah. what about cosmetics uh, cosmetics uh we got some cosmetic uh, uh like a palette you know yeah. you the cosmetics and put them on i got um i don't have it here setting out but a little egyptian cosmetic vial uh i what well, can you say fun. you know what e even in a time let's say during the american depression it said some things some businesses still succeeded more than others what kind of businesses were they cosmetics people can't <laughs> do without them you know yeah the women wanted to look beautiful in, in bad no, times no matter what even in bad times so. all right Okay, so we'll get together again next time talking about the life of women in ancient Israel. Absolutely. Thanks, Anne. Okay, Have great. A great day.